Good afternoon, and welcome to Like a Boss One-on-One -on -one Live. Today, Portland Press Herald publisher and CEO of Masthead Maine, Lisa DeSisto, will be speaking with the president of Bowdoin College, Dr. Clayton Rose. My name is Allison McCann, and I am delighted to welcome you. Now, I would like to take a moment and thank our sponsors, many of whom have been supporting Like a Boss for years, and they are Bernstein Shore, Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, Hub International, JP Morgan Chase, This Stitch, and Coffee by Design. And to get started, I wanted to invite Bill Whitmore, the Vice President of the Main Market from Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, to say a few words of welcome. Bill? Great. Thanks, Allison. And thank you to the Portland Press Herald and to Lisa DeSisto for continuing to come into our homes for the past six months. And I'm sure you're reaching a, probably an even bigger audience, maybe not with the coffee and, and, and others, but uh, it's really great to partner with you. And we're really happy to sponsor this event today. Uh, also, thank you to President Rose for stepping away from an unusual and I'm sure very busy semester at Bowdoin this fall to spend some time with us today. As you, as you know, President Rose leads Bowdoin, which is also my alma mater. Um, and the, the college has a commitment to something called the common good. Um, and it's something I think that we probably all could spend more time thinking about these days. And I just wanted to note that our organization, Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, through our foundation, in the past six months has donated $1.7 million to nonprofits across the state, United Ways, WISE, people, uh, um, addressing food insecurity, health centers, things like that. So we kind of feel like we're doing our part to support the common good here in Maine. So again, thank you, President Rose. I think also congratulations, you're coming up on a five-year anniversary with Bowdoin. And thanks again to Lisa and the Press Herald. Great. Thank you, Bill. And now I'd like to introduce our very first virtual Like a Boss guest, Joan Fortin, the CEO of Bernstein Shore. Joan? Hi, thank you, Allison, and thank you, Lisa, and the Portland Press Herald. On behalf of Bernstein Schur, I want to welcome President Rose and all our listeners today for the uh, first Like a Boss for this session. Um, Bernstein Schur is a 105-year-old law firm with 120 lawyers in offices in Portland and Augusta, Maine, in Manchester, New Hampshire. And as of the last seven months, in individual homes spread out from Maine to Texas. We are so pleased to be a sponsor of Like a Boss again this year. I think this is such an important set of conversations that Lisa and the Portland Press Herald put on. And it's really um, important to us to be a part of it. As we know, leadership matters. And in these turbulent times, leadership matters more than ever. I'm really excited to hear from President Rose today, um, who's a leader of one of the leading colleges in the country. And as a parent of Bowdoin's class of 2024, I was especially excited and heartened to hear President Rose tell the class that among other things, Bowdoin will teach them to be intellectually fearless. That lit me up inside. We need more of that. And I'm really excited to hear more from President Rose and Lisa. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Joan. And without further delay, I will turn things over to Lisa DeSisto and President Clayton Rose. Thank you, Allison, Joan, and Bill, and welcome everyone. It is great to be with you. We do wish we could be in person at the Portland House of Music. Um, they were such gracious hosts of our in-person event, and uh, we know that they are struggling. So um, please support them if you can. We do hope to be back there. Um, in person. And I am honored to have Clayton Rose, president of Bowdoin College, as our guest today. Welcome, Clayton. Thank you, Lisa. It's great to be here, and it's my honor to be here. So thank you for doing this. Oh, thank you. Um, so it would seem a little odd if we started off with the um, where were you born question like we usually do in Like a Boss. So let's really start with you giving us um, an update on what's happening on campus. What was return to, to campus like this fall? Uh, well, unusual, I think, as both Bill and Joan said, um, uh, for sure. Uh, the first thing I would say is uh, things have been going well so far. So far is always the operative word in a COVID-19 world. But um, we made the decision early in the summer uh, to reduce the density on campus. And we have about 35 to 40 percent of our students back anchored by our first year class. Joan's son is, is one of our students who's on campus. Um, 
uh, as well as a group of students who, uh, for whom uh, home is not a place where learning can take place because of the lack of a private space to study, internet connections and so forth. Some honor students who need to be using the facilities in the labs and performance spaces on campus and our residence life staff. And so we have about 650, 60 students on campus. Uh, some of our faculty, some of our staff is working from home and some are on campus. Um, and we're testing, uh, we have a, several layers to the programs we, we have in place to deal with COVID-19. A critical piece of that is testing. Uh, we test every student and every member of the faculty or staff who's on campus and interacting with students, myself included, twice a week. Uh, and then others who are on campus but not in contact with students uh, once a week. We've done about 15,000 tests now since about August 24th. Um, and uh, we had three students who came in uh, in transit, had, had the virus. We isolated them, it didn't spread. Uh, and essentially since then we've had, uh, we've had no, uh, no issues and you know, knock wood, so. Right, right. So you're very transparent with the information though that you put out to the community and to students and you have kind of a, a color coding system? We have a dashboard uh, that, that we have a color coding system for the status that we're in, red, uh, orange, and yellow. There is no green in a COVID environment. Yeah. Uh, we still have to be on guard. Um, but we were in orange when we started, which is there's some real restrictions on you know, where you can be and how many people you can be with and so forth. Uh, after we did two weeks of testings, which is the the outside limit of the life cycle of the virus and its communi its ability to be communicated, transmitted. There we go. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we then went to yellow and we've been kind of increasing the uh, engagement of our students with a, some notion of the normal life of a college uh, uh, through that. For instance, we opened up our, um, um, our gym facilities last week and folks, you know, we have a schedule and a way of doing that, but uh, so forth. So, um, so we're in yellow and then our goal is to stay in yellow. Yeah. So how would you say the students are, are adapting? Certainly not the experience that the freshmen were looking forward to. And um, also, how do you check in on their well-being? Because that's something that we talk about for really everyone during this pandemic. Absolutely. Um, so the uh, students, first of all, have been great. And uh, uh, they take seriously the necessity to um, um, pay attention and comply with all of the safety protocols that we have in place and they're active participants in the testing program and are helping each other to get better and better and uh, uh, so all of that has gone very well. It doesn't mean that there are, you know, we're all human beings. The whole country has challenges in, in compliance. So it doesn't mean that every student or every one of us, myself included, is perfect at every minute, but they've really been remarkably great. There, uh, I spend time uh, whenever I'm outside talking uh, to our students, as well as lots of the other folks who are on campus. Uh, they're in a very good place. Again, not every student at every moment because college right. is part of life and truths and so forth, but fundamentally they're in a very good place. And for our first year students, they're so pleased and happy to be at college, given that the last part of their high school experience was really blown up on them. The summers had mm -hmm. a lot of energy around it. So to finally be at college, even with the restrictions that we've got to have in place uh, to get to know each other, to, to be physically in place, to be away from home, uh, and to be, uh, to be able, in case of our first year students, they've got a class with their faculty and so forth. So, uh, so far, so good from that score. In terms of paying attention to their well being, this is, as you said, a really, it's critical at any moment, but it's really critical in a COVID-19 world. Uh, we have an amazing uh, student life um, uh, and resident life staff. They're the, the anchoring point for this. They are, we have deans who are in touch with our students on a regular basis. We have residents life staff that live with them and are in touch with them on a regular basis. But then we have a kind of distributed network of folks who really also pay attention, our housekeepers, our facility staff. These are people that get to know our students on a first name basis, our dining staff who see them all the time. They get to know them on a first name basis. And then we have a lot of resources, in particular our counseling and um, uh, student peer health uh, areas, which also are very engaged with our students. So there are a lot of layers to the touch points that we have with our students. And it must be even easier to make personal connections because, because the density's decreased, right? So. Uh, yes and no. The mask gets in the way. You can't always. Yeah. Talk. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And also now, Bowdoin is known for exceptional food service. So I'm sure the freshmen were looking forward to that. Have you been able to deliver on that with the bar so high? 
our dining service is not going to let a thing like a virus get in the way of providing awesome food to uh, to our students. They have uh, uh, they've they've outdone themselves in this environment in providing students. In the early days, we had grab and go, which was boxed meals, and they were exceptional. Uh, and um, I'll tell a, a, a modest story in a second. But as we've gotten, uh, you know, after the first week or so, we went into uh, being able to have uh, um, the regular kind of buffet lines and so forth where they could pick up their meals. We weren't eating in the dining halls in the same way because of the density. Food's been remarkably great. And the dining staff get what it means, what food means in terms of comfort and uh, a sense of well-being and, and, and acting as a calming agent for, for all this. And that 18, 19, 20-year-olds eat a lot of food. And I remember in one of our meetings, we have lots and lots of meetings ramping up for, for it. I, I had my list of things and I turned to the head of dining virtually on Zoom and I said, you know, Ken, I'm sure you've got this covered, but, you know, we've got meals and they eat their meal and then three hours later, they're hungry again. And he just put his hand up, he stopped me. He's a really wonderful human being. And he said, look, we've got, we got extra snacks, we got extra fruit, we got extra sandwiches. They will, they, we will not be able to use all of the food that we have prepared for them. And I would go around to the tents and the places and there was more than enough for even the hungriest football player to uh, be satisfied. So it's great. They've done a really great job. That's great. I know we're going to talk uh, more about keeping COVID off campus in the Q&A because a lot of people had some questions on that. Um, so let's transition to your path to Brunswick. And why don't you start um, with where you grew up, your first job, and of course, mention if you had any experience delivering newspapers. <laughs> well, uh, let me, so I grew up in Northern California in a suburb of San Francisco. Uh, I'm actually a fourth generation Northern Californian. So who leaves California? Well, you leave if you can come to Maine, I think is probably the answer to that. Um, uh, I did uh, uh, deliver newspapers as a substitute for friends of mine. Uh, on their paper route for the Marin County Independent Journal, uh, which is my hometown paper. Um, uh, my first job uh, was washing dishes at an English style pub in the town I grew up in, in high school. And uh, it was a greasy, horrible, hot, sweaty job. And that's what you do. And I learned a lot yep. from a lot of the folks who were there. So, yeah. Uh, and then uh, you went on to higher education. So walk us through that path. So uh, I was fortunate. I got into college. So I went to college. No, it's, um, <laughs> uh, I went to the University of Chicago and uh, for my undergraduate experience, very profound liberal arts education, slightly different, but not a lot different in many ways from, from Bowdoin. <laughs> Um, embedded in a larger university, but the college was 3,200 students. And, and when I was there, and it's 2,000 students at Bowdoin now, I le uh, immediately followed that with an MBA at the University of Chicago as well. And I, I spent um, uh, a number of years, a couple of decades in, uh, in finance, uh, a very you know, different kind of path here. But, but that, the educational model was, was a BA and an MBA from Chicago. So you have a great career in the financial services industry, a couple of decades, and then you go to get your PhD, right? Uh, I did. A, we, I worked at, at a terrific firm. I really enjoyed the people and the, the, the ethos that was there, the, the way we did business, which sounds strange to some in today's world about how we think about banks. Um, but there are some good banks and some good financial firms and lots of good people that work in them. Um, uh, but we sold the firm, uh, and I was part of the senior management at the firm at the time. I stayed for a while. They had a good job for me. It was, you know, I, I could have continued there, uh, and I, I think done, done well and so forth. But um, the place changed. It wasn't the place that I knew and I grew up in. And so I decided that uh, it was time to do something else. And I, uh, the first decision was to leave the firm on good terms and help them, you know, sort of settle all the things I need to get settled. Uh, and then I took about a year to think about what I was going to do next. And um, in the meantime, I started teaching uh, at uh, Columbia and NYU in New York. I was living outside New York at the time and um, uh, really enjoyed that. And I had always had uh, as, a, as a, a goal of mine, uh, the idea of going back and, and getting a doctorate, the idea of, of moving from being a mile wide and an inch deep, which is what, as you know, Lisa, very well you do when you're mm -hmm. in dealing with all these things, to going a mile deep on a very specific issue. So that intellectual challenge. 
Um, and I was also uh, very uh, interested in understanding at a very deep level the issues of race in America and why the, the, the issues persist. Um, and I'd done work in, and I ran, I'd run the diversity effort at the firm I was at for several years. I'd been involved in this work as a mentor and an ally. Um, so I decided to see if I could go back and get a, a doctorate focused on issues of race in America. And I was fortunate enough to, to get into Penn, University of Pennsylvania and in the sociology department. And so I got my doctorate there. So we're going to circle back and talk about um, your perspective on the racial equity movement today. So we don't want to we don't want to lose that thread. Um, and that was in 2007 when um, you got your PhD. So um, we look forward to to talking about that. So a question from Adam Siemens, who works at CMP, said, "What was it like to look for a job after you finished your PhD?" Um, uh, well, weird uh, for sure. <laughs> uh, so. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd continued to teach at uh, Columbia and NYU while I was uh, at Penn as well. And so approached each of them and said, look, I'm, I'm interested in becoming a full-time part of, a, of a, an academic community. They were, we went through a series of interviews and discussions about it and, and, uh, uh, and they were really uh, generous enough to offer me positions there. Um, on a, I'm a, big believer in networking and talking to as many people you, as you can about these, you know, decisions one's going to make in life. And uh, I had a friend who knew the dean at the Harvard Business School, and I had never had anything to do with the Harvard Business School or Harvard, uh, for that matter. But I asked if he might set up a cup of coffee just to get advice. What does he think about, you know, a guy who's now 47-ish uh, and uh, entering, you know, the, the academic world at this stage? And, uh, you know, whatever other advice he might give me. And so I flew up one day to Boston to go have a cup of coffee with him. And I, I truly, honestly, no ever any thought in my mind that I would ever go there. But by the end of the meeting, we were having a conversation about coming back and talking to them. And one thing led to another. So it's, it's the serendipity in life. It's a slightly different answer to your question, Adam, but it's the serendipity in life and kind of, you know, being a little bit nimble and flexible and willing to kind of have a, these kind of conversations. This was just dumb luck that um, I, you know, had that conversation with Jay. He was willing to kind of think uh, out of the box a little bit. And I ended up at, uh, on the faculty of the Harvard Business School for uh, eight or nine years, like whatever the number was, but um, before coming to Bowdoin. So um, I, I guess the lesson there is have as much coffee as possible <laughs> with people, right? <laughs> as many as- Many cups of coffee. Exactly. Many cups of coffee. Okay, so you get, how does the whole uh, applying for college president position work? Are you getting recruited? Can you describe the process? That was an ad in the Portland press here. No, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, so, um, the first thing to know is that every year there are uh, a number of these jobs that come up, right? You think about all the colleges and universities in the country and kind of do the math on how many folks probably are going to be up for a job. And then there are a handful of executive recruiters, headhunters that traffic and college presidents. And there are two in particular that, focus on uh, the liberal arts colleges and, and, um, and, uh, and the more well-known colleges. And because I'd had a background, my, my jobs when I was in finance were really in the last 12 years or so around managing uh, and running businesses. So I had management and leadership experience and, and then I had entered um, academic life and was a, a teacher and a faculty member at Harvard. And so that combination I think was interesting to, um, uh, to the, uh, the headhunters. Um, uh, it is not the traditional route. The traditional route for most college and university presidents is that you start as a junior faculty member out of graduate school, you become a member of the faculty, you gain some administrative experience, and then you go off. And, and there's real uh, reasons why that's a very valuable path. You understand the, uh, the nature of colleges and universities, the nature of faculties, in a way that someone who's done what I've done doesn't. You may, I may bring different and other sensibilities and skills, but, but, um, but that's the normal path. So a college also has to be in a position where they're willing to think about a non-traditional candidate. Every year I would get a couple of calls about a college that was interested in a non-traditional candidate from these headhunters. And in all but one other case, I, I, uh, I just, I said no, and they were fine schools, but I was very happy at Harvard and I, I didn't, wasn't interested. Bowdoin came along. 
I knew my predecessor. I knew a bunch of folks who graduated from Bowdoin. I knew Bowdoin's reputation. Uh, my wife, Julianne, and I have a house in Southern Maine. So Maine for us was a place that we love. Um, uh, and uh, I, the idea of the opportunity to be at Bowdoin it took me about a half a second to say, sure, put my hat in the ring, uh, with no expectation that I would get the job. And then you go through a series of, uh, you, you, well, first thing you have to do is you have to write a paper, you know, five or six pages of uh, some specific questions that they want answers to, but basically why you want to be the president of Bowdoin College and why you think you'd be a good president of Bowdoin College. So I put that together. That was September of uh, 2014. Uh, and um, I was fortunate enough to be asked to come back to be one of the, I think, 30 or so people that they interviewed in the first instance. I, I'm, I'm, I paid no attention to the process after I got the job, so I'm off on my numbers a little bit. But yeah. I had an initial interview, and then it got down to a short list, ultimately, to a couple of candidates. And then you go through a lot of conversations, which is very important for me and very important for the college to make sure that the fit is right. And uh, is, are there's the skill set that you're bringing and the sensibility that you're bringing and the sensitivity to the issues that you're bringing, the right mix for that college and its culture at this moment in time. And um, I was very fortunate that the search committee, which is trustees, faculty, staff, students, uh, thought I was the right person. And, and um, I've had, as I often say, uh, I've had a number of cool jobs in my life. This is by far the coolest job I'll ever have. It is the best job. So, How many people do you think mentioned Joshua Chamberlain in their uh, initial paper ah, that they oh, had to write? Uh, in, their, in, the, in the job application? Yeah. Oh, that's a good one. Um, I definitely I, would. I would lead with that. You'd lead with that, right? I love Joshua Chamberlain kind of thing, you think? <laughs> right. And that might be too much. That yeah. might be too much. Um, yeah. Uh, more than a few, probably. Yeah. yeah. So uh, October 2015, you are coming up on your five-year anniversary. So, well, it's um, six year now. So. Oh, six. Sorry. I, you know what? I, yeah, I didn't go to Bowdoin, so my math is bad. Um, so um, how do you get started? Um, so the, the, uh, I think there, there are two things that were in my head. Uh, one is to be very mindful that you need to learn as much as you can. So it's keep your mouth shut as much as you can, keep your ears open as much as you can. Um, uh, that's a general rule. Uh, and that was really my first year of really just trying to listen and learn and watch and observe and so forth. But very specifically, the uh, great colleges and universities the faculty are, play the central role in the life of the college, right? They obviously are uh, the, the, those, that, those who teach and they craft and create great scholarship and great art and great performance, right? So they're, they're doing these two central jobs as part of their mission. But they also have an essential role in the governance of the college and in the way that the college runs. And, uh, uh, and so I wanted to um, understand from the faculty what, the, what were the issues that matter to them? How are they thinking about the world and so forth? So I, uh, over the course of the first year and extending into the second year, I had uh, half hour meetings with each of the faculty in their offices, uh, several a day, just kind of moving down the list. And um, I have several notebooks filled with notes that I still uh, will go back to and flip through. Those were essential meetings for me, right? So there were some very specific things I got out of it, a much greater sense of the sensibility of the college and understanding the issues that were common and some of the idiosyncratic things that needed to be paid attention to as well. And so um, then what, what, what came after that? Because I wanted to talk about the knowledge, skills, and creative disposition work. Right. Um, so the, uh, at, at some point, presidents are required to do a couple of things. A set of kind of notion of a vision for the future, working in concert with the faculty and others, and raise some money and do a campaign. And they're often tied to one another for obvious reasons. Um, uh, As someone who's taught strategy at business schools, I actually uh, don't do the traditional strategic plan. We we think about strategy and so forth. But um, for me, uh, and this is now borrowing ideas from some of the great strategic minds of of, uh, academic minds out there, strategy is uh, at its essence about choice. It's about the decisions about the things you're not going to do and about how you go about putting that into play so that you, you understand uh, what it is that makes Bowdoin special and different relative to many other great institutions that are out there. 
uh, a, a central piece of that for us was um, uh, asking a group of faculty, staff, students, and trustees led by a faculty member uh, to examine a question that I put in front of them. And the question was you know, discussed with a lot of folks and socialized beforehand, but what knowledge, skills, and creative dispositions do we believe that every student that's gonna graduate in 10 years uh, should possess in order to be able to lead and deal with the issues of the world that will be out there in 10 years. So it wasn't about a specific curricular question, what kind of curriculum should we have? It was at a higher level of that than that, which will ultimately lead um, uh, into uh, the, uh, the notion of, of curriculum, of where resources are gonna be allocated, uh, um, and uh, you know, what we're gonna have to lean into and what we may have to lean away from. Uh, they did an amazing, it took a year to do that work. They did it almost, uh, with, with one exception, I had a dinner with them in the middle of the project at their request. I didn't get involved. Then the report was published. We started to work it, think about what we're going to focus on. That then became the backbone of work we're doing now, as well as central pieces of it are part of the campaign that we launched last February, just about a month before COVID-19 hit. So. Right. The, the From Here campaign. Right. Right. So I watched the video. Um, about it. And I would say you guys are not afraid to let students know how much snow we get. <laughs> There's a lot of snow in that video. Yep. Um, if you're coming to Maine, you need to know what you got to know. <laughs> you you got to know. So what were some of the things that came out um, that, um, you know, out of, of that, of that work specifically? Yeah, so I would, I would focus uh, or, or, or uh, point to two in particular that maybe are at the top of my mind right now. One is that um, the notion of all of our students having a greater skill and, and capability with quantitative and digital literacy. Now, you, you, one can't go to Bowdoin, this was true 200 years ago, it's true today, without learning to write better over the four years. Your first class, you're, you're writing, you write in almost every class you have, including a number of our science classes, and you get feedback on your writing as you move through. Um, so you you really learn to hone your writing capability. The same, if we're honest, and we were in this report, is is just not the same for uh, the ability to use data, to think about data, to think about the digital world, how data is manipulated and used, and so forth. It's less about it's not about coding per se, and it's not about math per se. It's about the the, the, the sensibilities and the and the insights that underlie that. And um, to operate in this world today without that, that, that strength and that sensibility is not appropriate. So we're focused on how we're gonna deliver that. We have a new program that we've just stood up last year called Digital and Computational Studies, which is a result of some work over several years. And that is a central piece of this. It's, not, it's different than our math department, which is awesome, and different than our computer science department, which is awesome. It's its own thing, which is focused on that to, to some extent. The other one I would point to is the um, uh, necessity um, uh, uh, to help our students understand how to make ethical decisions. Uh, and in the world we're in today, that seems more important to me than ever. Now, this is not about giving them the ethical model, but rather exposing them to the idea that they are going to be required to make ethical decisions. They're going to be required to make decisions and how will they do those in a way that are ethical and how do they think about what that means to them and how are they going to, how are they going to do that in a consistent way in a way that allows them to feel like they're, uh, they're leading a good life, doing good works. And as Bill said at the beginning, uh, serving the common good, which has been with us since the first day that we opened. Mm -hmm. So a question that came up repeatedly, what's the secret to getting into Bowdoin with a 9% acceptance rate? People are looking for some inside tips. Yeah, um, uh, um, if it weren't for Varsity Blues and that whole scandal, I'd probably make a joke, but I won't. Um, look, I, I think the first thing to say about it is that we do have, you know, like many um, uh, well-known colleges, we, we have uh, a, a, a low acceptance rate. We're at 9%. Um, we're very blessed that um, so many students are interested in coming to Bowdoin. Uh, the... Uh, the thing I would first say to parents in particular out there, I guess, and, and prospective parents is not to get freaked out by those kind of numbers. They represent everybody that applied and then the number that you take. And there are a whole bunch of students who are terrific that apply, but shouldn't be applying because it's not a place that speaks to them. It's not a place necessarily where they are their accomplishments are going to allow them to get over the hurdle. So while it remains a very competitive um, uh, place, the numbers themselves belie that a little bit. And 
The, the second piece is even more important, and that is that what reduces the odds further, again, in a very competitive environment, is having a student who uh, knows that Bowdoin is the place for them, that it, 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 in, the, in, in their, the depths of their belly, they know that this is the right place. And students know that about a particular place. And I've gone through this with my own two kids. I can walk on a campus and say, oh, well, check the box on that. And they're like, it's all down here. Um, uh, the second is that uh, understanding that this is a school that, um, you know, we've got very smart students and they're very accomplished in all kinds of ways and they get involved in all kinds of things. And that's true at lots of places. But um, there are two things that, that make us different. One is that we have a, a group of students who select us and we select them because they wanna be collaborative and not competitive. Doesn't mean they're not working hard. Doesn't mean they don't accomplish a whole bunch of things, which they do. Um, but they do it in a way that's not a zero sum game, that for you to do better, I have to do worse. And the second is they're very kind and we pay a lot of attention to that as well. And so the character issue and the collaboration issue are, are central pieces of what we're up to here. And so if your student is, fits that, the, then the odds get better. Um, mm -hmm. and, then, and then it's a challenge. And, and, uh, and, and so after that, I'm not sure I have great advice after that. So. So here's a question from Heather Scala. With COVID-19 having completely disrupted my daughter's junior and senior years of high school, making normal benchmarks difficult, what are the most important qualities and achievements you're looking for amongst your applicants for next year? Yeah, uh, uh, great, unfortunate, but, but great question. Thank you. Um, so uh, the first thing I would say is that we recognize and, and, and all the folks in admissions at colleges and universities around the country that we are in a, a very unusual environment. So no one is expecting the same kind of application material, uh, the way grades are laid out, the kinds of recommendations that necessarily may have come because of the disruption to those relationships and so forth. Um, I think the, uh, the ability to demonstrate um, academic excellence and growth and intellectual growth over time remains very important. Um, grades can be a way to do that. Test scores can be a way to do that. Uh, recommendations can be a way to do that. And there may be other ways, depending on the, the kind of intellectual uh, achievement that students have gone through uh, and, and have, have, have put on the board. The, the other aspects are, are the um, demonstrating the, why Bowdoin or College X that speaks to me as a student, right? That, that will remain really important. And then the ability to describe and, and write about and demonstrate through a, a record um, the, uh, the a kind of a deep commitment to uh, things that are important, right? It, and that commitment can be a sport, it can be an instrument, it can be a club, it can be a deep commitment to taking care of a relative, uh, uh, younger siblings or a grandparent uh, who needs help. Um, there's no one size, but it's being able to, 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 to understand, we'll reflect it upon and understand that these are the things, or this is the thing that I'm committed to. This is why, and this is why it's meaningful to me. And the student that works or that's taking care of a, of a, of a relative, um, uh, is as in good, a, is, is, is in as good a position as someone who's, you know, been a varsity athlete and, and, or, you know, a, a a terrific musician. All of those kinds of students uh, are students that we are interested in taking. So, um, and there are ways to demonstrate that through things that you write and having folks who write recommendations and letters of support and through the interview process as well. The last thing I would say as a piece of advice is the most important thing that in an interview that a student can do is be genuine. It's true in the essays as well. Don't try to think about what the school wants to hear. Be yourself as a student and the advice you can give your, your kids in, in that regard as well. So I hope that's helpful. That's great, yeah. So um, Bowdoin's pretty expensive. Um, how do people afford to go there? Uh, so we are really mindful, it's a, it's a great point, Lisa. We're really mindful of, uh, of the cost and the sacrifice that um, you know, essentially every family, no matter what their level of income and means is, has to make in order to send their child to Bowdoin. Um, I'll give you a, a, a just a, a talk about this in a couple of different ways. Our comprehensive fee, tuition, room, board, um, and, and the ancillary fees this year is about $71,000. Um, uh, it costs us each year 
this year about $98,000 to educate each student of full cost when we allocate it to students. So every student is getting a subsidy uh, regardless of their kind of financial background. And we're able to do that because of the incredible generosity of our alums and parents and then the work that our investment office does. And that's what the endowment does. It fills in that gap. And schools like Bowdoin, um, our peer group in the liberal arts community and the bigger private universities, that's the model that we've used. You have a large endowment that fills in that gap. Then for us, um, uh, we are at the center of our culture and our value system is the, um, the necessity, the desire and the necessity to ensure that any student that gets into Bowdoin is going to be able to come to Bowdoin regardless of their family's financial situation. And uh, we're one of 19 schools in the country that is need blind in admission. So that is we, we admit people without paying any attention to what their family's financial situation is. That sits off to the side. We make uh, financial aid uh, packages without any loans in them, only grants. And uh, we meet the full demonstrated need of every family. Um, we're able to do that again from the generosity of our alumni and our parents and then the work of our investment office, which has been stellar. Um, but that's a, a, it's expensive, but it's, it's the commitment that we have. Half of our families are on aid. Um, uh, and, uh, um, and there's a, a significant amount of, of, uh, financial aid is the single largest budget item that we have each year after salaries and benefits. So I hope that answered the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. So let's, um, we had a lot of questions about this, about making Bowdoin students ready for the world. So this one comes from Tony Buxton at Pretty Flaherty, who asks, what does Bowdoin do to educate all students on the protection of democracy? Yeah, uh, timely question. Um, so the first thing I would uh, I'd say is I'd step back and think about a liberal arts education more generally. So the, in the current world where, you know, words are, are weaponized and politicized, li having a liberal arts education is a bad uh, branding thing. I think if we were to brand it today, we probably wouldn't use that word. But that word liberal actually comes from a Latin derivative. I think it's pronounced liberalis. And it, it is an education that uh, had its origins in antiquity. And, and it was about creating the, um, about educating citizens to participate in the life of the city and to be able to have discourse and debate about the important issues of the day. For me, there are three pieces uh, or three essential goals for liberal arts education and for a Bowdoin education. One is to uh, um, give us the, the, the tools for, to live a more meaningful life, to understand the world better, to understand the people in the world better, uh, to be able to learn throughout your life. The second is to have success and satisfaction in work. Very important two words. And the third is to be able to engage effectively in, uh, in the life of, of uh, in, in the civic life of our towns, our cities, our, our country. Um, and we do that by, um, in several ways. First is the core education, teaching our students to be critical thinkers, to be able to reason well, to be able to look at data and analyze it and understand it, uh, to be able to push back in a thoughtful and respectful way, engage in that discourse and so forth. Uh, and that comes in the classroom work that we do. And then beyond that, um, we, we, there are a number of different ways that we engage in this, um, but I'll touch on, on three. Some are all consuming and some are more focused. One is that we have the McKean Center for the Common Good on campus. And this is a way for our students uh, to come in and to be able to exercise and engage in their interests in the world. Service work, government work. Uh, we have a huge drive now to get out the vote called uh, the vote called Bowdoin Votes. Um, and there are a lot of students that go through this and engage in this, and it's a way for them to engage in the life of our democracy. Um, the second and a more focused way is uh, that we have a, um, a program we stood up a couple of years ago called the Bowdoin Public Service Initiative. It was the brainchild of conversations um, that I had with one of our former alums who was a longstanding member of the State Department ambassador and uh, 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 really remarkable human being. And um, uh, and that has students who uh, uh, do work in Washington, D.C., in agencies, in NGOs, in the legislature, and in the court system. Um, and we've now been, and they, and they do it in their sophomore year, and they do it in their senior summer. Um, really a great program. The third is, uh, and this was mentioned by Joan at the very beginning, is the notion um, that I've been very hawkish about since I arrived, 
that one of our jobs as a great institution of learning is to create the, uh, the conditions for our students to be able to uh, engage with ideas with which they disagree with very strongly. And that can ultimately uh, not only make them uncomfortable, but could offend them. Uh, in the world that we're in today, having the, uh, uh, the ability to engage with those individuals and with those ideas in a constructive way or an effective way is a better constructive and effective is the way they're going to change the world, not by turning away. Obviously, there are some issues and ideas and we've seen some in play, which are odious. And that's not where, what I'm talking about. But there are fundamentally a lot of issues on which we disagree and where we've gotten into the cable TV news kind of place of one side yelling about their ideas and the other side yelling about their ideas and nobody's having a conversation and talking about them. Um, for our students to be able to do this well and to be able to do better than our gen my generation, they have to have the knowledge to be able to go into that discussion and understand the issues. And they have to have the emotional fortitude to be able to stand up to people who have a very different point of view and perspective than they do. And uh, that only comes with practice. Uh, and you need that kind of practice on our, uh, our campus. So we've tried over time to invite folks that represent a variety of different points of view. It's been uh, uh, very good and healthy, not without um, debate on campus about whether this person is a good idea or that person, that's fine, but we've never had a thing interrupted and none of that, everyone's been treated incredibly respectfully and thoughtfully and so forth. So I hope that gives you a sense. It's, it's the mission of the college, this notion of, of fostering democracy and it comes in so many different uh, parts of, of what we do. Well, such relevant words for, um, for the moment that we were in, certainly. So let's shift the, though um, to another um, uh, current topic. Your PhD is on race relations in the U.S. So given that background, what's your perspective on the racial equity movement today? That's uh, a, a, a huge question. And um, so I'll touch on a couple of points. And, and Lisa, you can take that and, and push me and we can run with it in whatever direction you want. The, the first thing I would, I would just uh, touch on briefly is that I have considered myself to be someone who uh, you know, kind of, I don't know, I was woke, I suppose, um, to use the, the, the term. Um, but I, um, I ran a diversity effort at a large company. Uh, I've been an, an ally and a mentor in, in certain respects. I have a doctorate that deals with these issues. I've taught them at a couple of great universities. I've uh, been involved in them as a leader and administrator. Um, what, what the last six months have uh, shown me personally is that I, I was really missing where I was and not understanding that I wasn't doing all the things that I needed to do, wasn't understanding the problem in the way that I needed to understand it. So there was a lot of personal reflection. Similarly for Bowdoin, we've done some really um, great work in some aspects of what we've done, but there's a lot more that we need to do. Uh, and so we're going through that work. If we think about it at a societal level, I think... Um, uh, I think the same things are true. I'm involved with or know folks who run, you know, a variety of organizations away from Bowdoin. And I've never witnessed in kind of the probably 30 years I've been involved in this work now, uh, the level of engagement and uh, seeming commitment now from uh, important organizations and leaders of that organizations to reevaluate uh, how we think about the problem, to have some sense of a common understanding of the problem, which is an issue, mm -hmm. and to recalibrate how the work is going to do and to sustain it over time. And uh, I am I'm hopeful now. Um, uh, the sustaining part is critical. Uh, we've gone through too many kind of, we get excited, we do, you know, there's a flurry of activity to use a phrase that somebody um, shared with me earlier today. And then we, we kind of get distracted by other things. That cannot happen now. Um, uh, and there has to be an acknowledgement, which, which is, you know, I say that with such definition, such strength, right? But there has to be an acknowledgement that race matters in our country. It is, it is dispositive in the opportunities and the outcomes and the lived experiences of our citizens. And if you are black in America, by virtue of the color of your skin, you are at a significant disadvantage. And the data are crystal clear on that, whether it's health, education, jobs, you know, go down the list. Uh, and we have to fix that. That is not right. 
Well, I think your point is really important about the sustainability of it um, and just to, just to stick with it. Um, but it's remarkable considering your educational background that y you had sort of your own personal awakening. Yeah, I, yeah. yes. Yeah. And I hope I continue to uh, kind of be reflective on that and not get caught up in the same trap. So. Well, I'm certain your students um, will allow you to do no nothing but that. So um, they're the ones that seem to have uh, the most focus on it. So uh, we, we look to them to show us the way. Absolutely. All right. So I'm going to, um, we have a bunch of questions that have come in and some that were submitted in advance. So I'm going to um, go through them as quickly as we can here. Um, a number of sort of um, COVID Bowdoin uh, questions. Um, what do you see as the future direction for small liberal arts colleges as they are battered, battered financially by the fallout from COVID-19? And that's from Peggy Sagal. Hmm. Um, so Peggy, I, I, I would uh, I'd probably divide the world into two kinds of, of liberal arts colleges just generically. Those that are uh, financially sound and have uh, uh, larger endowments, of, you know, Bowdoin, and the ones in, uh, uh, with, well, I'll use Bowdoin as an example. I won't put, use others and provide labels, but, um, but I, I'm worried, and, and they'll, we'll be fine, and there's a large group that, that are financially sound that are going to be fine. There'll be some challenges, and we'll come to that in a second. The ones to worry about are those that have been in a precarious financial situation for a while. I talked about this, this challenge of the cost of an education and what we charge. And our numbers are no different than many other colleges and universities. That gap can be slightly bigger or slightly smaller. But, um, uh, uh, and it, 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 what happens is to reduce that gap, you start uh, limiting the uh, kind of engagement that you have with faculty, the number of faculty, the kind of equipment that you can have to engage in the intellectual exercise, and then the ancillary and support services that come around in education. It's not about rock walls and, and, and wood burning ovens. It's very much about the kind of uh, nuts and bolts of an education. And I worry a lot about a group of schools that um, uh, where there, there may be decisions that are going to get taken about the value of the education there and the cost of that education. And you can get into a, a, a kind of a spiral where fewer and fewer students and then they don't have the ability to, um, to pay for that. And I think that was always the thing that's been out there. COVID has accelerated that. And I think that that will be a problem. Um, you know, I think the, the, the relevance of our, of our educational model uh, could not be stronger today. Um, we're in a world where things are changing incredibly rapidly, where we're dealing with uh, multiple issues at the same time. And it's precisely the kind of education that allows you to think critically, to reason well, to communicate well, to learn uh, quickly, to be able to, um, uh, uh, um, uh, to bring people along and to lead. Those are the, the attributes of a, uh, of a, of a a strong liberal arts education and what we uh, what we provide our students at Bowdoin and many other schools provide as well and uh, this is exactly the kind of environment where that education is going to um, uh, see its greatest value I think. So I see a bunch of questions people are anxious to get back on campus at Bowdoin like for example uh, what are you thinking about reopening the art museum to the public when will the campus open back up to alumni with me uh, membership and fitness facilities? Yeah, uh, good questions. And, and one of the jobs of a college president is to uh, make sure that the alumni and the, and the neighbors are, you know, are happy. So to the extent that they're not happy, I'm sorry about that. I, it's a little bit of a joke, but only a little bit of one, because I know that these things are important to our community and to our alums. The, um, uh, the campus will not be open for the rest of the semester. Uh, I think that's true. And I think it's, we haven't made decisions about the spring yet. But the reopening of the art museum and uh, um, and some of the other facilities, the fitness center and so forth, certainly wouldn't be taken until we're uh, well into the spring semester and we see how it's going. Um, so it could well be a year where we're not we are not open in those regard and, and with respect to that. Um, uh, you know, I, I remain hopeful. Obviously, to the extent that there's a breakthrough on the science side, that we get a widely distributed vaccine sooner rather than later, that that changes the game. So, um, uh, and that would be great. I'm, I'm uh, given what I know, I think we're looking at a second, best case second quarter, 2021 before we get any of that, but, um, but we can remain hopeful, so. Um, 
I wanted to do a little segment on kind of Bowdoin and Maine. This question comes from David Pease at Bangor Savings. How can Maine liberal arts colleges and Maine employers better partner to attract and retain diverse talent in Maine? Yeah, uh, thanks for that, David. Um, so uh, I, first of all, this is challenging work, right? We know the demographics of the state and, the, and the, what we see is the patterns of our college graduates leaving to go to other places and the aging of the state. Um, I think we're starting to see some of that turn in uh, Southern Maine and in the Portland area and particularly in the greater Portland area, which is great. And I also know of former uh, of, of Bowdoin alum and actually former students of mine at the Harvard Business School who are uh, moving, deliberately moving to Bowdoin, or to, Bowdoin to, to Portland and to the area here uh, um, uh, to both uh, to create balance in their life between work that they want to do and a life that they want to have. It's really interesting to see some of that. So some of that is going on. What we can do, uh, each of us in the colleges in Maine has career planning offices. We call it Career Exploration and Development, CXD. Apparently, if you have an X in something, it's very sexy. And, <laughs> um, uh, but is is for the uh, companies in Maine and for our career planning offices uh, to think about what the job opportunities are, what the training that may be required that's outside of the curriculum but can be done separately. Uh, and I don't wonder whether, uh, just thinking out loud, we ought to put together kind of an employer and a career planning office, uh, you know, Zoom forum for folks to kind of brainstorm about ideas. But I'm, I'm going to take that away and talk to our, uh, our career exploration and development person. Um, I think as well, uh, I suspect all of you know, and there may be some on, but the new Rue Institute in Portland, I think will also has the potential to play a, a a meaningful role here in creating a cadre of uh, a center for technology and life science excellence and a cadre of graduates and employees that are focused in that sector. Uh, that has a lot of potential in terms of the human capital here. And for all of us in the eco educational ecosystem, it's very complementary. It's not competitive. So I'm really optimistic about what can happen there. That's fantastic. You just answered Susan Morris's question. So uh, wonder, wonder, wonderful. Um, from Sarah Voville, how are you incorporating teaching ethical decision making into the Bowdoin curriculum? Uh, a, a great question. We're working on that. That's that came out of the uh, knowledge, skills and creative disposition report. Um, and one of the, uh, the, the bodies of work that we have in front of us is to think about, obviously, there's a philosophy class on ethics, and there are certain classes where, in political philosophy and so forth, where these questions may be front and center. But if you are in uh, the biological sciences, there are profound ethical questions, and uh, we need to, to amp up the engagement that our students in those classes have around those questions. In, uh, in, all, in all parts of in economics, right? What are the ethical questions about economic models? And, and, you know, there's a lot of criticism today of capitalism. How do we think about the ethical implications of that? Um, and in a balanced way, not in a soundbite, you know, cable TV news kind of way. So we're at work trying to think about that problem. We do not have that one knocked yet, um, but we, we see what the goal is. And now we have to figure out how to infuse it into the curriculum. So we're getting close to the top of the hour. And uh, my apologies to folks questions that we did not uh, get to. But um, what's so I have a couple just to, to wrap up here. Um, what's the best advice that you give? Uh, well, I don't know if it's best. I'll tell you the advice I, I think is the best advice I give, um, which is to be comfortable with uncertainty. Uh, that decisions that you make, particularly about life choices, there's, there's, it's never going to be certain. You're never going to know if it's going to work out. So you have to be willing to understand that, you know, it may not work out or it may not work out exactly the way that you think it will. But, you know, and, and you know, there's some chance that things may really go a little wobbly, but ultimately you'll figure out how to get back on track and keep moving. And the folks that I know who've been most satisfied in their Kind of professional lives in particular are folks that have been willing to embrace the idea of that there is uncertainty and you have to make decisions and then know that that's going to come and, and contend with it. And uh, so that would be. Well, very relevant for this time right now. Yeah. Now I ask this question at every like a boss, but it seems um, uh, just really relevant right now, which is what keeps you up at night? 
Yeah, well, COVID. So yeah, there's right. No, uh, no, I mean, as you know, Lisa, right, there's no more important job for a president of a college or a leader of an organization than the health and safety of, of, the, uh, of the folks at the college or in your organization. And um, uh, and here we have faculty, staff, students, we have the town of Brunswick and the larger community. Uh, and so, yeah, I worry about, uh, about the effects of COVID. That's the, the single thing that keeps me up at night right now. Mm. I think all, I think all of us. Um, okay, what is the secret about Bowdoin College that few people know? Yeah, so uh, I'm sure we have a box of secrets somewhere, but I have enough. <laughs> so we all know that. Um, I think we all know that Bowdoin's food is renowned around the country. It, uh, we're consistently ranked either the highest or the one or two in uh, college food. It is really exceptional. You talked about that earlier. Um, what I think most folks don't know is how we do it, right? So we don't outsource anything. Our people are all Bowdoin staff. Everything we cook is cooked from scratch. Uh, we have a meat shop on campus where we grind our own hamburger, chicken burgers. Uh, we source from uh, local farms. We have our own uh, kelp farm out at the Schiller Coastal Studies Center in Harpswell, the 120 acres we have out there. We have an organic garden, um, and uh, uh, so it, the the bread, the desserts, the soups, the main courses, everything is made from uh, from scratch in our kitchens by our folks. And by the way, we do it more cheaply than uh, the average peer group uh, college that uh, uh, that's that they, our average peer school. Well, now I'm ridiculously hungry, and I want to say that we are all coming over for lunch. As soon as you tell us, we can. Yeah, so. as as I, I can't get a meal there. The meals are only for students right now. So as soon as I can get fed, you all can get fed. So. <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds great. Well, thank you, President Rose. We're fortunate to have Bowdoin as part of our community here in Maine. And best wishes to you, faculty, students, as we combat COVID-19 together. Um, Join us on October 23rd when I will be talking to Liz cotter Shalax, the CEO of the United Way of Greater Portland. And I wanted to let you know that you're going to get an exit survey when you leave today. And we're looking uh, to line up our guests for Like a Boss 2021, I can't believe. Um, so we would love your suggestions. And again, Clayton, thank you so much for your time today. And all our best to everyone at Bowdoin. Thank you, Lisa. We're very lucky to be here in, in, uh, in Maine. And thank you for having us.